And I would like to invite uh, the concluding spec uh, speaker of the morning session, uh, Jerry Cooper. Well, uh, Senya and whoever else had helped you, I, uh, I'm uh, really thankful that you organized this event. I think it's a uh, great thing for us to celebrate uh, Bob's 70th birthday and all of the accomplishments he's uh, achieved. Um, I uh, second and third and fourth the comments previous that uh, his, uh, his unbridled enthusiasm, his boundless curiosity, and his keen intellect are an inspiration to me and I think most everybody else that comes into contact with him. Uh, what I'm going to give you here is a uh, description of uh, uh, a a relationship that has lasted uh, over 38 years. So I go back to the beginning. And uh, with that, I go to my first slide here. Uh, there was a first generation of graduate students. Uh, Don Harder on the right was his first graduate student. Uh, Dan Gauthier, who I think will be here later today. Oh, Dan's there. Uh, was uh, sort of uh, in the early period. And he also uh, overlapped with quite a bit of the shenanigans that happened early on. Well, uh, Don and I, I mean, I uh, had an advisor, Mark Skeets, in chemistry who had a joint appointment in optics. And so I uh, had shared mutual interests with Don. Uh, one, there would be uh, symposiums in the uh, optics Institute where they have uh, donuts. And as a poor graduate student, a nice donut in the middle of the day was always a pleasure. Uh, but uh, Don and I also liked beer. And uh, Don found out early on in our collaboration when we worked in the lab that uh, you do not allow Jerry to drink Jenny Cream Ale. Uh, the gastrointestinal disturbances that occurred would manifest itself the next day and uh, would not be pleasant to work with me. Uh, so Don uh, made it a habit of if I was going to get a beer, he would buy and give me a Heineken or something of a higher quality. But uh, the other shared interest we had was uh, Don was his first student. Uh, I think it was a collaboration with Mike Raymer, and they shared a lab. Uh, they had a quant array uh, uh, laser system. It used an unstable resonator, uh, and they pumped, we were pumping a dye laser, and they had aspirations to do high-resolution spectroscopy with this system. The issue was that this laser's output had no control on the longitudinal modes of the uh, YAG system. So it was uh, plagued by this problem they called mode beating, where longitudinal modes would compete and would create intensity spiking. And if one wanted to then pump a uh, narrow dye laser, this intensity spiking would create all kinds of havoc. So uh, Don uh, understood that I also wanted to do, I was a chemist by trade, and I wanted to do some high-resolution spectroscopy experiments. So we got together uh, and came up with a concept of using a resonant reflector oscillator. But first, we had to demonstrate it. Well, at that time, it was the fourth year of my graduate studies, I uh, had the distinct uh, honor and privilege of my advisor leaving me to take a full position in Australia. So at that point, uh, I was an orphan, and uh, Dr. Boyd and Raymer were kind enough to allow me to work with Don and move into their laboratory. And so we worked uh, together to create this laser system. And uh, what we did was I had a two-headed uh, Quantel laser system and we married it with the two heads of the quant array system. So we found that four heads were better than two. And uh, it was quite a system. I uh, helped Don create a sink pump dye laser with uh, 
less than 0.03 uh, wave numbers bandwidth. He did some of these works that are uh, referenced here. Uh, Paul Naram was uh, Bob's first postdoc in the group, and uh, Don created a uh, sodium cell, so we were able to tune the dye laser to the absorption of the 589 transition of sodium. And uh, the work is referenced here where they show the uh, detuning of these robbery frequencies as a function of the pump intensity. And then you have spectrally, you see the two robbery frequencies uh, about the uh, main frequency of the system. So Don assured me that uh, He'd go first, get his PhD done, and then all would be well, and I'd stay in the lab and be able to use the system. Well, uh, it was quite an intricate system here. I show you, if for those that are in Bob's group or had been in it, it uh, this was room 13, 313 and 314. The system covered two rooms. In the first room here, we have the four-headed YAG system. Uh, as I said, it was comprised of two heads from a Quantel system and two from a Quantaray system. This was back in the day where you couldn't buy a lot of these things off the shelf. You had to compose and construct them yourself. Uh, so we had to have a custom uh, circuit to drive both of them in synchronization. Uh, the oscillator was a passive die system that had a resonant reflector uh, that narrowed the frequency of the device. And then we had three stages of amplification. Uh, back then, uh, Dan hadn't achieved with Bob the uh, concept of a nice Faraday rotator to isolate them. So we used a die cell in between two of the amplifier heads to isolate the back uh, noise from interfering with the oscillator in there. Uh, the output was then doubled, and we sync pumped a uh, laser system that was comprised of a, a modified Littmann design dye laser. Uh, that concept is the basis for almost all of the external cavity diode lasers that are now purchased from companies like Toptica and Mog Labs and all, where you use a grading at high incident to get you your mode selectivity of the, uh, over the bandwidth of the emission. Uh, so this had that going for it, but uh, we added another twist. We added a second grading on it, and uh, for the high resolution scans, we would tune the second grading at about 300 megahertz frequency steps. Uh, it was then amplified in a second die, and then there was a flowing die cell that provided the final boost. So for Don's experiment, he'd have a 589 laser coming out. For my experiments, I actually uh, worked with a material where uh, I wanted the 333 nanometer uh, excitation, so I had another harmonic crystal over here. I took a piece of the output fundamental, and it was 660 nanometers, and that carried my frequency rings. On the right panel here, I had a pulse molecular beam, and back in the day, before we had these uh, cooling techniques with the lasers, we used a uh, technique where you take an expansion, it's called a supersonic uh, expansion, where you seed the beam with some of the material of interest in th with a uh, an inert, uh, I had argon gas in there, and you expand it into a uh, vacuum system. What that does is effectively coalesces the translational uh, speed of all the molecules and effectively makes them almost uh, four degrees or less degrees Kelvin. So in my case, I could take a very complex molecule and cool it down and do spectroscopy on it and in a way that you could understand it. So the reason why I gave you the uh, lozenges there, as Dan would probably tell you, uh, the, the lab smelled like those uh, wintergreen lifesavers. Wintergreen uh, lifesavers have methyl salicylate. That was the ma material that I studied. It was uh, forms of an ingredient and of infrarub or Bengay. Uh, it's this flavoring agent you, you taste in the mint. And it's also an antiseptic agent in Listerine. 
Uh, one day when I was working in a lab, you can see it was a very extensive thing, I pulled a muscle and I went over to the pharmacy and I said, geez, I've got to get something for this. And being a chemist, I always look at the ingredients in there and I looked at it and it said its main ingredient is methyl salicylate. And so I put the thing back, went back to the lab and grabbed the bottle that I had of it and started rubbing my... <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, the interest in this molecule is it has an intermolecular hydrogen bond and so it's an analog of the DNA structure that makes up all of our bodies. Uh, we were able to do a... a a uh, experiment here where we got the, uh, the molecules very cold and we had with this laser system a bandwidth uh, less than a tenth of a wave number. It turned out I was an orphan and within six months of when I finally finished two other groups, one in uh, Wesleyan University and Ahmed Zawail at Caltech published similar to work to what I was going to do. But luckily, at the U of R, we had better lasers. And uh, there's no better example of that than last week's Nobel Prize being awarded in physics to Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland, who uh, I, I used to sit in on Gerard's uh, group meetings, and I knew Donna Strickland from uh, her being an institute graduate. So uh, back then, uh, we were a hotbed for laser jocks, and uh, that's actually what I ended up doing for the rest of my career. If I take now uh, 20 years or 25 years past, where I just met Bob over the years at conferences and his students, uh, I then came back to Rochester, and uh, Bob uh, had a need. Uh, he had a funding source at DARPA that said, I'll fund you money if you have a small company. And uh, Bob approached me and I said, well, I'll make a company. The, the name came about because uh, you just have to come up with a unique name in order to register it. Uh, it was going to be the in first initials of our last names, uh, Cooper and Boyd. But at KB Optics sounded too much like KB Toys, so I added the N there, and Bob says, oh, that's for nonlinear optics. And I said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've gotten a couple of SBRs. It's mainly a, 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 um, a hobby of ours. It's not a main front of our efforts, but it does give us an avenue to get funding for various projects that are uh, in line with the interest of us. And, nonlinear optics, uh, and low light level experiments. So that has been fun over the years. And uh, one of the experiments uh, that we got funded, Aaron Schweinberg, was, who's here in the audience, helped us, where we, uh, they, we were contracted to uh, look into the nonlinear properties of fluidic lenses. And the uh, concept there was these uh, lenses, which are used to uh, ch change the focus in imaging systems and all, might provide some protection for high power or short pulse laser systems. Well, we looked at the materials and me being a chemist, I understood quickly that the, these materials that allow you to change the focus of a lens had no real uh, nonlinear response. But we said, well, what could we do potentially to provide this protection they were looking for. And so uh, Sonia uh, left some CS2 around in the lab and we decided to take advantage of it. And here we show some pictures of the results we got. These are near field pictures and these are far field pictures. And this is like five microjoules per pulse up to about uh, 80 microjoules per pulse. And you can see that the spatial coherence of the laser beam is uh, disrupted. The nice thing about this is it's very fast. So any other concept of trying to provide optical protection for sensors and all, uh, you have to have a sensor that then reacts fast enough to protect your optics. Here it comes naturally just by the material. Uh, we never got the follow-on money, but what we were going to do was maybe not put our eye there, but we'd verify that this does indeed provide protection from subsequent optical damage in an optical system and all. Uh, 
So that's that. We had other ones that I won't go into, but uh, what I also wanted to bring up was uh, we had a celebration for Bob achieving the uh, Shallow Award in 2016, and we had, a, again, a large gathering of his former students. Here we have Dan and Don and Alex Gator. I think he was going to be here. I don't know if he'll be here today. Uh, and then some of the other ones, as you might notice. Uh, and the one thing I, I can say about uh, working with Bob is you become a part of the family and it's a close family and we all stick together. You can see by the smiling faces at these people that, uh, that uh, they had a great time and it's not a torture for Bob uh, to work with you and to uh, have fun also to celebrate. I mean, this makes it seem like we're always celebrating. Well, there's a lot of good things that Bob has achieved and it's a lot to celebrate. And, here I'd want to show the, the latest part of the family and where this picture shows most of the Ottawa family that has joined in. And I think it's only, uh, I don't know, they say one child and then you have a second, it's not additive. Well, uh, this isn't additive either, Bob. You have a heck of a family you've created here and I want to thank you for letting being adopted early on in your uh, family growth. Thanks.